study coming up. <laughs> so uh, just in case you didn't know, uh, we have a church-wide study that you have all volunteered to be a part of. Thank you so much. Uh, there, there are these flyers outside of the, uh, the, the sanctuary right there where you can pick up with a wonderful QR code. Uh, you should have received an email if you're a member or visitor of this uh, church. And if you didn't get an email, just let us know at the office and we'll make sure that you're getting our emails. But either way, sign up for this uh, church-wide study. This is for everyone. Big, small, young, old, everybody in the church. And we made it so easy for you. You can pick the day and time that works best for you or days and time that work in your schedule. And we're going to form small groups around your schedule so that this whole church can be a part of this. And this is how it's going to work. We'll have a sermon on Sunday, and this begins October 6th. And then during the week afterwards, we'll have small groups that meet, and there's no book to read. I know some of us are like, oh, man. <laughs> I got some applause. I know there, there's like three of us here, including me, like, oh, man, we don't get to read a book. But everybody else, there's no book to read. We'll have scriptures, and everything will be conversation questions uh, uh, around the scriptures that you'll read. And, it, and it's an opportunity to grow with each other. Also, there's another uh, study that's going on that if you're not a part of, I think you should be. And it started last week, and if you missed it, that's okay. I'm sure Becky is fully willing to accept more people, right? Absolutely. It's called the Fireproof uh, Marriage uh, Course, and it's wonderful. It's all around a movie, and they're showing movie clips and having great discussions. You don't even need to be married to be a part of that. But to, if you are human and breathing, you are welcome to be a part of this, Bible stu or this book study. Um, also, we got fifth quarter Fridays, uh, and this is homecoming. So following homecoming, uh, the homecoming the, in the fifth quarter of the game, which means when the game's over, uh, we will have ice cream and open gym and uh, activities and stuff going on for that. So we need you to be there to help volunteer and eat ice cream, right? Win-win, right? We win, you win. And uh, Wednesday Night Life is every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, for youth and children. And uh, there's the women's group that meets there as well. And um, uh, also this week, uh, if you're part of the Mayus community and you are a man, then uh, we, are, we have something for you because we have a, a, a men's group or union group for Emmaus that meets every uh, uh, thurs, third Thursday at 6 p.m. here at the church. Uh, you can see Brad Blaha for it, and, uh, and he'll get you connected in that. If you're just interested or just want a great group of guys to hang out with, you're welcome to come as well. So we encourage you for that. So a lot of stuff going on in the church, um, wonderful things that are happening in the community. But right now, uh, the most amazing thing that we get to do is we get to greet each other in the name of Christ. Amen? So let's stand and greet one another. Take a seat, please. We've got another announcement. Good morning. I'm Faith Ward. And um, if you don't know me personally, you probably know me as the lady who services the altar on Communion Sunday. Uh, but I'm here today with a different hat on. I'm a member of the Lions Club. If you don't know what the Lions Club is, it's a service organization. It's an international organization and uh, with over 1.4 million uh, members. And we often, we have a lot of drives and things that we do ourselves, but we also uh, uh, partner with other charities and uh, other missions throughout the world. And at the present time, we are partnering with uh, the Souls for Souls. It's a shoe drive and you'll find a box in the fellowship hall and we want shoes from baby booties all the way up. Men, women, children, animals, whatever. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's, these, these shoes will go to third world countries. Uh, 
where it's often very, very difficult to get a pair of durable shoes. And uh, it's especially, I always emphasize the children, but I want you to understand that the men and the women, they need them too, because they have in many of these countries this little parasitic flea that bores into the body through the soles of people's feet. And it grows up to 2,000 times its, the, the, its original size in just 10 days. So very shortly, they have these horrible tumors all over their feet. And the only way to get rid of them is to have them excised by a scalpel, you know, you know that thing that doctor uses. And uh, so uh, this, to, you know, one of the main things in life is to have healthy feet, OK? You walk around barefooted. Even here, we can get tetanus. Now, I do it all the time. But that doesn't mean it's wise. Uh, the, uh, in addition to um, the, the health reasons for wearing shoes, children need shoes to go to school. In many countries, it is mandatory. It is the law. And anybody who has children or have had children, you know how long a pair of shoes lasts a child. It's very, very difficult to get shoes uh, because, you know, we can do other things for, th for other things. We can grow some food. Uh, we can make some clothes. We can put in a water filter that'll last for decades. But to get a durable pair of shoes is very, very difficult. The, if you, you can't get an education, you know, can't go to school, you can't get an education, you can't get an education, you can't do better for yourself. It's a co common wisdom that education is a key factor in long-term poverty elimination. Now, Nelson Mandela famously said, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. How tragic that bright, eager children would be kept from their la best chance at changing their circumstances through a lack of a pair of shoes. So we have a long-term goal with, with Souls for Souls to eventually no, have these people no longer need these. And so the shoes that you donate will go to a, a entrepreneur in, in different countries um, that is supervised by Souls for Souls, the international organization. And they will offer these shoes to people at like probably 10 cents or less of our money. Because in Sudan, South Sudan, one of the poorest countries in the world, the rate of exchange for their pound in 2011 was 285 to, for, to a dollar. Now it is 2,850 pounds to a dollar. A pair of shoes costs anywhere from 11,000 to 21,000 pounds. So by having these, these shoes placed in the businesses where the people can actually buy them, it not only adds to their economy, okay, it's something they can afford, it adds to their pride, it adds, adds to their feel, feeling of uh, being a person and, and uh, supporting their families. So I'd ask, ask you all to please you know, dig through your closets, have your friends do the same, your neighbors, dig out all those shoes, like I said, babies, men's, women's, boots, whatever, and bring them in and put them in the box at, 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 in, the, in the hall. Thank you very much.
Will you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we take this time to focus on you, to put you first, and to commit our lives to your service. We come before you with hearts full of gratitude and reverence. We remember the lives lost, the sacrifices made on September 11, 2001. We ask for your comfort and peace for all who continue to grieve and for those whose lives were forever changed. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. Lord, we also ask for your protection and your strength for those who serve as first responders and caregivers. May they be guided by your wisdom and sustained by your grace. As we reflect on the events of that day, help us to remember the strength and unity that emerged from the darkness. Grant us the courage to face the challenges ahead and the compassion to support one another. May we be, be a beacon of hope and love in the world that often needs it so desperately. Help us to honor the memory of those who have passed by living lives of kindness, justice, and peace. Let their legacy inspire us to act with courage and to build a world that reflects your love and your grace. We place our trust in your promises. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are cherished in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. Thank you for your presence with us in times of trial. May we always seek your guidance and find comfort in your internal embrace. Lord, we lift up all of those affected by the tragedy on September 11th. Help us once again become one country, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Bring us back to our roots to follow you, to worship you, and proclaim you are the only God in heaven and earth. Without you, Lord, we are nothing. We are simply vessels here, empty shells on this earth, rummaging around, until we ask for you to come into our lives and be the forefront of our decisions and, and the rest of our life, do we then be filled. Lord, I cry out now for your intervention in our government to save us, Lord, to, to bring back those leaders to destroy their selfishness and humble themselves before you. That's with the confidence of all the people of God, we say your prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. assisting with the offering to come forward and as they as they come forward I'd like to uh, to share something with you um, yesterday there was this little event that happened in the in the square called the Kolach festival y'all have heard of that right and um, during that event uh, our church set up a prayer booth right there on the square and, uh, you know, we, we had expectations that we'd get a few prayers. And, and I was uh, privileged to serve from the, the first lot, ten, uh, from 8 to 10. And 
Uh, up until 9 o'clock, I think I prayed for one person. And around 9.15, people started rolling into the square, and it got very busy. And I probably prayed for 30 people from about 9.15 until 10 o'clock when my shift was over. I spoke with Marianne and uh, Matt Barone, and uh, they prayed in the next shift, and they prayed for over 50 people. And I haven't really touched base with, uh, with what happened in the other, the other, uh, uh, other uh, shifts. There were two other shifts. And let me just say, if nothing else, that shows us the need that is in our community for the people of God. This community needs you. They need your prayers. They need your comfort and strength. And, and I tell you, we, we prayed for everything, from families to finances to the country. I even got to pray for donuts. That is an actual prayer. But, but honestly, we, we need to be the people of God for this community. And so let us pray over our offering today. Holy Father, as we give our tithes and offerings, let them go to build your kingdom in this community here. Let them go to, to share your grace through Jesus Christ. Let them be resources that are used wisely and boldly to proclaim your name in a world that so desperately needs you. Bless these tithes and offerings for your will and your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just as you are here in the spirit home, come just as you are, come and see, come receive.
just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come receive. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, church. Um, Now I get to give you a blessing. 
you don't get to listen to me speak today. Amen. Amen. See, I knew I'd get one <laughs> in. You know. Sorry, my mic's on. <laughs> so as you can tell, we have a guest speaker today who is fully mic'd right now. And, uh, but uh, if, you were, if you joined us last week, you know that we're doing a series where we're inviting people to share their testimony on why they serve this church, why they serve the kingdom of God. And it is my, my uh, great privilege to introduce to you Rebecca Chapman, who will be sharing her testimony today. Let us welcome her. Sorry about that. That was very funny, Kirk. <laughs> um, before I start speaking, I want to acknowledge real quick, I know um, Philip really arranged this service to have a special focus on remembering September 11th and our first responders. And I just wanted to share, uh, if any of y'all know my life before the church, uh, I was a reporter and I spent five years as a police and fire reporter for the Eagle. And I spent my time with a lot of first responders. I got to know them very personally. I did ride alongs and um, they need our prayers more than ever. Um, September 11th is a day that we take to remember our first responders and be thankful for them. They face challenges we can't even imagine. I think every single week I would read a police report about them getting bitten, spat on, kicked, um, their families threatened. We need to be very appreciative of them. And we had an event at this church on September 11th where our Caldwell first responders, our firefighters, EMS workers and police officers came to the church and we prayed over them and prayed for their safety. And that was an incredibly special time. I saw kids that were motivated to put their hands on the vehicles and pray for those first responders. And um, the whole time I was thinking about a good friend of mine from Waco who is a police officer and a um, Iraq veteran who passed away last month. And though it wasn't spoken about out loud, it is understood that he uh, took his own life and he had a pregnant wife. So I thought about him that whole afternoon and it is just so important that we pray for our first responders because what they're going through we can't even imagine and I'm, I'm just so thankful that God puts them here to protect us because they really are warriors for us so anyway I had to share that but let's get into it so we're going to talk about the story of Esther today it's part of my testimony um, Esther's a great story. If you're a woman who's been through a women's ministry, you've probably talked about the story of Esther. It's very popular. And if you're a fan of Veggie Tales, there's a great Veggie Tales rendition of Esther. So Esther was a humble Jewish girl. She had been orphaned and was being raised by her older cousin Mordecai, who had adopted her. In that time period, the king of Persia, which is a country we now know today as the country of Iran, was searching for the most beautiful young woman in his realm to become his new queen. He ordered that all young virgin women be brought to him so that he could select a new wife. Excuse me. He delighted in Esther, chose her, and crowned her as the new queen. At this time, Esther kept it secret that she was Jewish as her cousin instructed her. One day, Mordecai refused to bow down to a man named Haman, who was a powerful advisor to the king. Jewish people did not bow to men like Haman. This angered Haman. He went and told the king that the Jews were secretly breaking the king's laws. Believing Haman's lie, the king thus ordered the genocide of all Jewish people in the kingdom. The news spread across the kingdom that the Jews were soon to be killed. Mordecai got a message to Esther about what was happening. He insisted that Esther needed to approach the king and reveal to him what Haman was doing in order to prevent the genocide and save her people. But Esther was frightened. The king had a rule about anyone who came and spoke to him without the king first requesting their presence. Those who approached him without invitation would be killed. Mordecai reminded Esther of her heritage. She was a Jew. Did she want to stand by while her people were killed? She could be killed too if the king learned of her ancestry. She must be brave. Mordecai suggested maybe God put her in this position of royal power just to help in this situation. Esther bravely approached the king without his request. The king, though, was not angry at this. He was actually delighted to hear from her. 
He told her that he would be happy to give her half of his empire if she wanted it. But Esther was still too frightened to testify against Haman. Instead, she requested to have a week-long feast with the king and Haman. She then actually waited until the second day of that feast to finally reveal what she needed to say. She begged the king to spare her life and the lives of the Jewish people. The king was infuriated at Haman's plot and had Haman executed before pardoning all the Jews. Esther saved the Jewish people, and the king even allowed for the Jews to attack some of their biggest enemies throughout the realm. The Jewish holiday of Purim was thus established, and it's something that's still observed by Jewish practitioners today. The story of Esther tells a classic rags-to-riches version of the hero's journey. So we see stories like this told in modern fiction today, such as the modest hobbit Frodo Baggins saving Middle Earth, or the dorky and lonely teenager Peter Parker being endowed with superpowers and becoming Spider-Man. Esther is a historical account of a real person who went from the bottom of the social ladder, so an orphan teenage girl who was part of a racial minority, who became one of the most powerful people in the Middle East at the time, pretty much overnight. Her new power came not because she was particularly superhuman, but because she was chosen and in the right place at the right time. Esther didn't just win the lottery and get to cash in her ticket for a life of quiet luxury, though. Just as fame, power, and fortune were thrust upon her rapidly, so was a great challenge. It was up to her to save millions of lives by risking her own. What kind of person can you think of who would do something like this, who would risk their own life for other people? Maybe a Navy SEAL, someone tough, expertly trained, extremely talented, and who signed their name on the dotted line to die for their country. But this was a teenage girl who was forced into marriage and didn't volunteer herself to be in this position. When I think of the story of Esther, I smile because I see a lot of myself in Esther. While I do love to volunteer and serve others at times, a lot of times I also find myself thinking and saying what I know Esther must, must have been thinking. Number one, I didn't envision any of this for my life. Number two, there is no way that I am the person qualified to do this, so I will probably screw it up. And number three, I'm scared and stressed that something bad is going to happen to me if I take this on. I also think I'd do exactly what Esther did and procrastinate my actions, like when she had to host a feast to tell the king about Haman, and even she chickened out until day two of the feast. What I love about Esther's story is that God picked an unextraordinary person to become extraordinary and do possibly the most important act of service in the nation at the time. He also used her, despite her being pretty much reluctant in the bravery department. Not everybody can be a strong martyr like the Apostle Paul and gladly, joyfully go to prison in the name of Jesus, but God still uses people who are timid and unsure in their calling. So I'm going to take another sip of water here. Sorry, I get dry mouth when I talk. So if y'all don't know my story about coming to be an employee of the church, a couple years ago I um, realized I hadn't been really volunteering or serving in the church in any way. I would attend with Stu, but uh, my husband, but I w wasn't doing anything here. So I thought I'll volunteer to push slides in the morning, so have the slides go by when you're singing. So I approached Kevin and said, hey, I would like to do this, and we arranged a meeting in his office. And I came there thinking he was going to take me up to the balcony and show me real quick kind of how to do the slides. And I somehow walked out of that meeting with a W-2. And I didn't even know there was a job opening. So he just said, you're going to be the communications director for this church. And he made me apply immediately. I don't think we even talked about slides. So... I couldn't believe that happened, and it was a total whirlwind, but I got the job. It's very strange to me that I'm here, both employed for the church and now having the opportunity to stand up and give a guest sermon. Right before I got this job with the church, we went through our disaffiliation, and only less, that was only less than a year after I'd actually become a member here. I was one of those few in our church who voted for us, I think maybe 11 people, to remain United Methodist. 
When we finally disaffiliated and joined the global Methodist denomination, I remember feeling really unsure about the future. I remember thinking, oh gosh, am I on the outside now? I struggled with the thought that I would not be accepted here and that my social and political ideals would keep anyone from listening to me or caring about what I had to say. I even legitimately worried that parents would shoo their children away from me, worried that I would corrupt them with be my being different. I felt like a bit of a big green alien, not just here in Caldwell Methodist, but in Caldwell overall. It was a lonely feeling. You can imagine my surprise when Kevin offered me this job. I could not believe that this church wanted me to work here. Even after accepting the job for the first few months of having my role, I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop and for somebody to tell me that I wasn't a good fit for this community, not the right kind of believer they were looking for. Well, not only did that not happen, but God started using me in ways I hadn't expected. Now I've got a finger in pretty much every ministry, it seems. Now I'm talking to people about faith and God on a weekly basis, and they're actually listening and responding. Now I've formed close, close friendships with our staff that exceed even the good friendships I've made with coworkers at other jobs before this one. When Esther was presented before the king with thousands of other young women, there's no way she thought she was going to become the queen of an empire. When I reached out to Kevin asking if he needed volunteers to push the space bar in the mornings, there's no way I never thought I was gonna, it was going to lead to me being here on stage talking to you like this. Esther certainly wasn't part of a group of people that fit in or held power in the realm of Persia. I can't imagine she thought she would be equipped to run an empire. Being on the smaller side of the disaffiliation vote, I was worried I wasn't equipped to serve our church after we became global Methodist. And Esther was not the bravest person at first when it came time for her to save her people. It took her quite a few tries to finally do what God was requiring her to do. I definitely do not do my job perfectly, and I certainly have days where I'm not measuring up to what the Lord requires of me. Maybe I'm scared, maybe I'm stressed, maybe I'm just lacking inspiration, but God still uses me. I look back over all the great moments I was able to capture on video for Vacation Bible School, which thousands of people got to watch online. I think about the night that Marianne was homesick and Tori was out of town, so I took over Wednesday Night Live that night for the evening and got to teach the Bible to all the kids with George and Savannah. I think about Blessing of the Animals last year, which we're having again this year, um, where we were able to raise several hundred dollars for local animal rescues and bless some people in our community. I can't believe you guys let me do all that, and I can't believe God let me do all that. But to quote Mordecai, who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. There are plenty of very valid, valid reasons why you might not be able to volunteer. Um, maybe you work some crazy hours, maybe you're dealing with a chronic health condition, etc. But if you take any way, anything away from what I'm saying today, let it be this. If what is stopping you from volunteering and serving in the church and in our wider community is that you think God doesn't call people like you to do things like that, just remember the story of Esther. And Marianne said this in her sermon, and I promise we didn't both plan this, but God doesn't always call the qualified. He qualifies the call sometimes. And if you feel out of place at, at this church, at Caldwell Methodist, for some reason, and that's what's stopping you from volunteering, let me tell you this. I feel, I think, I believe that there is a place for you here, and God's the one who made that place for you here. He made that place for me when I didn't think my piece would ever fit into this puzzle. I want to give you a little homework, and Cindy, if you could put, there should be a slide, perfect, thank you. I want to give you a little homework. For the next week or so, I want you to practice this response um, when you face a challenge in your work life, your home life, your school life, whatever it is. Maybe it's a fun kind of challenge, or maybe it's an uncomfortable and upsetting challenge, but regardless, I want you to remember that you are the son or the daughter of the king of all creation. You are created for godly things, both big and small. And you have his destiny baked into every atom of your being. You are a prince or a princess. So when you face that challenge, I want you to find something shiny and look at your reflection and repeat to yourself the same words that Mordecai told Esther. Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Tell yourself that for every challenge you come across, 
Keep it in consideration when you're presented with an opportunity to serve others. You know, God could have put Mike Tyson in your place to fight your battles. He could have put Albert Einstein in your place to make all of your hard decisions. He could have put Mr. Rogers in your place to nurture all your broken relationships. He could have put Dave Ramsey in your place to handle your finances. He could have put Mary Poppins in your place to raise your children. He could have made hundreds of copies of those people if he wanted. He's God. But he didn't do that. He put you there. He put you there with perfect purpose. If you start believing in your own potential and open yourself up to be used by the Lord, you will be really shocked just how far he will take you. And I'll go ahead and pray us out. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful group of people. Thank you for creating them and for bringing them to church today. Thank you for Caldwell Methodist Church and for all the trials we go through and the mess that got us here and the mess we are today because it's a beautiful mess. Um, I thank you for all the love that we share and the love that is between us. We really are a family and I'm just amazed every time I get to interact with this family and I'm so grateful and humbled that you put me here. Lord, I just pray that every person in here knows that no matter how small or insignificant they feel as human beings, you know, we're all just little folks in a little town, just remind them that they can do such big, amazing things and make amazing waves, not necessarily because they're particularly superhuman, but because you are God and you have created them with a purpose and remind them that there's nowhere where you can't use them. Lord, thank you again so much for all of your blessings. I pray that we have a wonderful, wonderful week, and I pray that the Cowboys win today. Love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let, let, let's give Rebecca another round of applause for, for sharing her testimony. I'm so proud of her. As we go forward, remember that you are called specifically by God to serve him, to serve his kingdom, and to serve his people. 
You don't need to know how to do everything. You don't need to be perfect at anything. We just need to be responsive. And we need to answer, here I am, Lord. So as we answer that and as we step into the mission field, which is the community of Caldwell and beyond, go forth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.